everybody. So welcome to the first podcast where we're going to spend some time uh, exploring the patterns and the principles of inheritance, uh, which just to, on a personal note is probably my favorite unit and we're moving into what will be the next couple units are my favorite um, of the whole year. So let's just get going. We spent a bunch of time talking about meiosis in the last um, unit, and that was primarily to get the point across that organisms go through, you know, what amounts to being a lot more of a big deal to sexually reproduce. I mean, it's more energy, um, you know, you have to find a mate. I mean, it's, it's way more taxing than asexual reproduction because of the importance of having variation in the offspring. And this variation allows us to have generations and subsequently following generations that are not identical to their parents. Um, and this is really important down the road when it comes to the population surviving over time. So we know that those individuals, we have variation. We're not identical one to one another, to our parents, to our siblings, to whatever. We are a unique combination um, of traits, right? And how we inherit those traits uh, for a while was not very well known until we hit about the mid 1800s. And here uh, we meet well, he was a monk, but in essence, a scientist by the name of Gregor Mendel. And he was very interested in how organisms received the traits that they did. And he, he's it. He is the, the granddaddy of um, our modern understanding of inheritance um, and how we get the traits we do. He gave us that foundation and his principles still hold true for a number of traits, but we've been fortunate to figure out a lot of other ways that traits can be inherited as well. So let's talk a little bit about what he did. Uh, he did outstanding experimental design. You pick a good species to study. In his case, he chose your average garden pea plant. Okay, and he did this because they're very fast in their generations, so you don't have to wait too long between generations. Uh, they're plants, they're not gonna go scurry off on you. And they had enough differences in traits that he could look at a number of different traits, repeat experiments to see what the outcomes could be. So it was pretty cool that he did that. So again, they're easy to grow. You could have true breeding, meaning they were um, going to be in essence like a purebred right there's going to be no um, you know if I have a pink you know a pink flower every generation has pink flowers there's no other you know color that's going to pop in there so pure breeding for pink um, and he did this with a number of his plants they were very easy to manipulate because they will self fertilize um, themselves or he could cross pollinate as well and short generation time, okay? So going from parents to offspring, from their offspring to offspring, didn't take a very long time to do. So he replicated what he did, and not only that, by replicating, he created a huge sample size. Think about when we do a lab in class, right? You and your lab partner will do that lab, and then we'll combine data with the class. You know, we do that so that we can build up sample. So in essence, you and your lab partner do a lab and then the other, you know, 10 groups are doing the same lab. So we have it repeated 10 times, can pull together our data and get huge sample numbers comparatively to if we just looked at your individual group data. And he was one of the first uh, scientists to really bring math into it, to use statistics, one in helping predict and make hypotheses, and two, to help explain the results that he had. He, um, because it's, you know, when you're looking at such high numbers and, you know, lots of raw data um, to make heads or tails with it, he started to bring in some math into the play and some statistics and probability, which we'll be doing too. And those results were then presented in a very, very clear manner. And in some cases, they were too good. <laughs> um, uh, as he planned ahead, as he looked at various traits, we look back on his data and we wonder, hmm, could he have cheated? It's come up a couple of times because some of his data is 
like I said, almost too perfect. And but when we look at the traits that he looked at, you know what? Um, the things that he gave us still hold true. And we haven't found anything yet to really get in the way of that. All right. A big deal about this particular podcast is going to be on lingo. All right. So, Gene, you've heard this before. Okay. Gene is going to be obviously a very important term. We're going to talk about it a lot. Um, our working uh, definition of what a gene is is that it's a unit of heritable information that it gets passed on from one generation to the next. And that heritable information, in essence, is a section of DNA. All right, now at the time of Mendel, we didn't know about DNA yet. I mean, obviously it was there. We hadn't discovered it yet. We didn't know of its existence. Mendel didn't even know about genes or chromosomes yet. So, I mean, when he did his stuff, he was working off the idea of tiny elements being passed on. Um, and then as time progressed, we found out about chromosomes. We found out about the fact that chromosomes were made of DNA. And in the last, what's amount to a little over 150 years, we've come a long way, baby, um, in our understanding um, of the information that makes up who we are. Now we know our genes come in pairs. They come in homologous pairs because, remember, one parent, other parent, together they go, right? Each chromosome has a partner. Allele, we know this one. These are alternate forms of a gene. Um, so you could have a gene that codes for a particular trait, maybe the shape of my earlobe. Alternate forms of that gene would be, does my earlobe attach directly to my ear or do I have a dangly lobe? That would be an allele, okay? Is different forms of the gene. So for example, here I have my pair of homologous chromosomes and we call the location of where a gene sits on the chromosome, we call that the gene locus, okay? So the loci for a gene where it's located. So on the gene, okay, I might have it come in multiple forms, but here's my locus. You're gonna have alleles, okay, that are gonna be in the same location on each homologous pair, um, and you find them there. So here I have one particular gene, here's another gene, here's another gene, okay? Um, and you can see different genes might be further apart from one another, closer, okay, you get the point. Different chromosomes have different genes um, and different numbers of genes because of their length. So when we talk about alleles, um, and we're talking about tracking them from parent generation to offspring, we like to designate each gene by giving them a letter, okay? And in Mendel's experiments, some of the first forms of inheritance he gave us was this idea of dominance versus recessiveness. And when we um, talk about um, dominance versus recessiveness, we always designate the dominant allele with a capital letter, okay? So my dominant allele has a capital. And the dominant allele will be the allele that is expressed, that's shown, regardless of what the partner on the homologous pair is. So it can be the other dominant allele, it could be um, a different form of the gene, but if I have at least one out of my pair is a dominant gene, that's the one that gets expressed when it's in a pair, okay? The other form of that gene um, is gonna be what we call recessive. And that one we give the lowercase letter to. And you can use any letter, it doesn't matter what letter you use, but we capitalize one for dominant, we lowercase the other um, for recessive. And a recessive allele will only be expressed or shown or seen that you even have it if both of my alleles in the gene pair are recessive. So if I am, my combination on my gene pair is this, I'm going to express the dominant trait because I have a dominant allele. If my gene pair is this, one of them's the dominant allele, the other one's the recessive, I'm still gonna show the dominant trait. It'll be like the recessive's there, but it's never shown. So no one would ever know I had it unless I had a kid, okay? And those, these two forms are gonna show my dominant. Now, the only way I'm gonna show a, a recessive trait is if both of my alleles let's say in my gene pair. So remember, there's one chromosome, here's my other one. If both my alleles are recessive, then I show that trait. So that's all that means. And this was really the big inheritance pattern that Mendel viewed 
and did his work on was this idea of dominance and recessiveness. And that's where we'll begin. That'll be the first inheritance pattern we will look at. So when we're talking so when we're talking about that particular combination, what do you have for a combination? I have a big letter, a little letter, I have a dominant, I have a recessive, I have two recessives, I have two dominants, um, alleles. Uh, what I'm talking about, my actual genetic makeup is referred to as my genotype. Okay, this is actually the, what genes I have and what combination they come in. Um, and so again, genotype, so for gene, right? Um, big term. You will be expected to know what that is and what we're referring to when we talk of ways that genotypes can be. Remembering that all of our genes come in pairs, so we have two of every gene. So we're going to have two alleles. They might be the same, they might be not, for every gene that we have, with one exception, and we'll get there later. Okay. My gene pair could be big A, big A. When you have the alleles are the same in the pair, that is referred to as homozygous, okay? Homo means same. You've seen this prefix come up before. Zygous refers to, like zygote means coming together, okay? So when I have the same two alleles, they're the same, the bringing together of two alleles, homozygous, and if they're both dominant, I call that genotype homozygous dominant. If my genotype is one dominant run recessive or they're not the same allele, okay? Then they're different, right? And the prefix we use for different is hetero, okay? So heterozygous now. This means I'm a hybrid. That means I have one of my alleles in the pair is one form. The other is a different form. In this case, one dominant, one recessive. Thirdly, if I have two recessive alleles, I would call that genotype homozygous because they're the same, but recessive, okay? So really two ways your gene pairs can come. You're either homozygous for an allele, both alleles are the same, or you're heterozygous. One allele is one, then you have a different allele for the other. Now phenotype, okay, my phenotype is an expression of my genotype. What I show, okay? What traits do I actually present, okay? Does my earlobe attach? to my ear? Do I have a hitchhiker's thumb? Do I have a widow's peak? Those are phenotypes, okay? My genotype helps determine my phenotype, okay? And certain factors are gonna play a role in the phenotype show. the big one being your genotype. But we're finding more and more and more that our environment actually plays a role in the phenotypes that we have and can actually alter phenotypes. Okay, but the big deal is your genotype is going to lay the groundwork for what your phenotype is. Am I type A blood? Well, I am type A, so what's my blood type? Okay, um, if I'm type A blood, which I am, that's my phenotype. However, my genotype tells me what actual combinations of alleles I have that dictate what that phenotype is. All right, last slide. Basic Mendelian laws. First one, okay? law of dominant recessiveness. This, as I mentioned, was the first thing that Mendel really gave us, and this is where we're gonna begin um, our process of understanding how to actually do genetic crosses, which will be part of a series of what I'm gonna call mini vodcasts um, in the next bit, and each one will represent a different type of inheritance pattern and crosses. Um, so we know the law of dominance and recessiveness, okay? Um, and what Mendel did was he figured out that if I take a particular true breeding white plant um, and cross it with a true breeding purple plant, okay, he found that all of the offspring were purple. So that's what he found. So he took, again, just to kind of show it here, he would take a white plant he crossed it with a purple plant. This was known as the P generation, my parent generation, okay? And when he crossed these true breeding plants, now remember, he didn't know anything about genes or anything like that. When he would gather all offspring, every single one of them were purple, okay? And because of that, he was like, whoa, wait a minute, what happened to the white, right? This is known as the first um, generation, what we call F1, and that means filial, 
okay? And it's talking about subsequent generations. So the F1 generation, he would allow the F1 generation to self-pollinate and give us our F2 generation. And when he did this, he would get a result that floated right around 75% purple to 25% white in terms of flower color. All of a sudden, the white was back. So because the purple showed up in every generation, he dubbed this the dominant trait because it showed up in every generation. He called the trait that seemed to disappear in the F1 but reappear in the F2, he called that recessive because to recess from something means to step back. Like when you go out for recess, right? What are you doing? You're taking a break. Um, so he called it recessive because, not because it was less of a trade, it doesn't mean it's weaker, it doesn't mean the dominance like, ooh, I'm stronger, I'm better. It means that the recessive didn't show up in the F1, but reappeared in the F2, okay? And so that's why he called it a recessive trait. So this is how it works. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to leave us there because what we'll do in class is I'm gonna introduce to you the steps you take to figure out what we call a Punnett square. So right here, um, when you're trying to determine possible outcomes, we call that a Punnett square. So I'm gonna spend some time talking um, about that in class with you and there'll be practice um, for you to go through and we're gonna use the law of dominant and recessiveness as sort of the kickoff um, to learning how to do these crosses because the actual steps you take for the cross is the same. What you really have to pay attention to is the actual inheritance pattern and how they're actually put together. You know the law of segregation and you know the law of independent assortment already. Um, these basic Mendelian laws we call them because Mendel first realized this in his studies with pea plants. Just to remind us, segregation that deals with the way that a replicated chromosome lines up and separates in mitosis, right? And so when you replicate the chromosome, it separates. The law of independent assortment, you know, this talks about one chromosome um, pair in meiosis not dictating the way that another chromosome pair separates in meiosis. And we're going to come to that when we actually talk about um, a type of cross known as a dihybrid. Okay, so have a great night and get ready to have some fun with traits and with figuring out the possibilities of um, traits being passed down to the next generation. So take it easy and we'll see you later.